Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to this worship service at the Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to worship together. We believe that God is here right now, ready to touch our hearts and listen to our prayers as we lift our voices in praise. As we continue our sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, today we turn our attention to virtue of patience. Our senior pastor, Reverend Doug Lane, will be delivering a message that will inspire us to explore how it can shape our lives for the better as children of God. So let us worship with open heart, ready to receive the wisdom and grace that God has prepared for us today. Now, let us take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Please join me now in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. God, make us fertile all soil. In this time of worship, till our heart so that we will grow your fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In our daily lives, keep us from striving, and instead, help us trust the work you are doing in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. My name is J.C. Lyle, and I started attending here at Riceville United Methodist in the year 2000. Since then, our congregation has nurtured me, challenged me, given me countless opportunities for service and leadership. In fact, in 2006, I participated in a local mission day through the church with a nonprofit I'd never heard of that was founded by the United Methodists. We repaired the home of a recent widow, and I learned about the organization, Wilmington Area Rebuilding Ministry. I fell in love with the mission and stayed involved. Three years later, I was hired as WARM's first full-time executive director, and I still work there. It's the honor of my life to witness firsthand God changing lives in our community. When I was hired, I had no educational or professional background in nonprofit management. I had very little leadership experience outside of church committees. I was not equipped for a job running a nonprofit, but God doesn't call the equipped. He equips those who answer the call. And through Wrightsville United Methodist, he has equipped me and continues to equip me to carry out his work. This is an example of the UMC mission statement to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I am one of the millions of disciples that God has made through the UMC. I love working in the nonprofit sector. It's full of mission-minded people and improves the world in countless ways. And we work really, really, really hard to raise money. With the good intention of connecting donors to our mission, we use a technique called transactional giving. By that, I mean, of course, buying an event ticket or an auction item that benefits the charity. I also mean for $1,500, you can buy a wheelchair ramp for an elderly person or your $50 will feed a child for a month. One donor pays for one thing, transactional giving. It offers a variety of ways to get involved, provides a tangible result of our donation and satisfies our desire to make a difference. But transactional giving can distract us from the real work of changing the world together. It can bring philanthropy down to, here's what your $500 can do all by itself. 
Transactional giving is finite. That approach would do a disservice to the mission of the church. Even if we tried, we couldn't put a price tag on make one disciple. No, because we do our part and God does his part. Unlike transactional giving, spiritual giving is limitless. Your $500 is combined with millions and millions of other Christians' dollars and multiplied by the God of creation to advance Christ's mission, a mission that began over 2,000 years ago and will endure throughout eternity. Doesn't that sound awesome? For those of you who faithfully give, thank you for being part of this incredible journey. Prayerful giving brings you closer to God, and supporting the mission of our church brings us closer to each other. I give because I'm grateful for all that God does, and I want to be a part of it. Over the next few weeks, you'll hear more stories about why people give, and I encourage you to join us in exploring why you give and consider deepening that commitment this year. I'm going to leave you with the words of Henry Nouwen. God's kingdom is the place of abundance where every generous act overflows its original bounds and becomes part of the unbounded grace of God at work in the world. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all, wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. All for pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, beautiful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to lead us in prayer today. Will you join me now as we go before God in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today in your name. God, we thank you that you are big enough to be able to unite us together in prayer even when we are apart physically. We thank you, God, that you are patient with us. When we read the story of scripture, we see that you never give up on us. No matter how many times we fail, you are always there, willing to stick with us. God, we ask today for patience that reflects your patience. Make us more like you. As you understand us, help us to understand the people around us so that we can be patient even when they frustrate us. God, sometimes we're impatient over little things. But you know, too, that we also wait for big things. We are waiting for you to set the world right. We are waiting for your justice to roll down like waters. We are waiting for death and sickness to be no more. We are waiting for you to wipe away every tear from our eyes. We are waiting, Lord Jesus, for when you return in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. It is hard to be patient when we are waiting for these things. We thank you, God, that we are not alone in our waiting. 
Romans chapter 8 tells us that the very earth is groaning, waiting for you to set all things right. As we await your ultimate victory, we know that you've called us to help bring your kingdom to earth. And one of the ways you've given us to do that is to pray. So God, we pray now for all those who we are especially concerned about today. And we name them before you now, either aloud or in our hearts. Lord, thank you that you hear our prayers. We love you and we trust you. Now help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we move now into a time of reflection and giving, I'd like to remind you that you can always give to the ministry of Wrightsville United Methodist Church in several ways. You can use the U.S. mail, as well as our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, and our smartphone app. Let us now continue to worship God. Hi, Wrightsville kids. I'm Pastor Julia. Today, I want to talk to you about patience. Has your parent ever asked you to be patient for something when you were waiting? Or maybe a teacher or another grown up? I have to be reminded to be patient all the time. But it's so, so hard. It's really hard to wait for things. I remember when I was your age, I used to really have trouble waiting when my mom would make pancakes on Saturday morning. I love pancakes, and I didn't want to wait for all of the time it took to make the batter and then put it onto the griddle and flip them and all of that. And so one time I saw that big bowl of batter sitting there on the countertop before it was cooked, and I thought, maybe I'll just have a taste of that. Yeah, it's not cooked yet, but It'll taste the same, right? Well, I stuck my finger in and had a lick of that pancake batter, and it was awful. It didn't taste anything like a pancake. And I realized that even though it was really hard to wait for the pancakes to be ready, it would be a lot better once they were ready, instead of trying to eat it when it was just batter instead of a pancake. Well, I'm sure you know that waiting is really, really hard. But the good news is that today we're learning that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. That means that it's not something that we have to have all on our own, but patience is something that God does for us, that God grows in us like, like a tree has fruit on it. And so even when you're frustrated and really having a hard time waiting, you can know that God will help you to be patient. God will help you to wait. So the next time that you're waiting for something and it's really hard, whether it's for pancakes or your birthday or for Christmas or for another time to come on the clock so it's time to do something exciting, Remember that you can ask God for help and ask God to help you be patient. Let's say a prayer now together. God, thank you for making us and thank you for loving us so much. Thank you that you promise to help us be patient even when it's hard. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Thank you for taking time to watch us on the Vine. And I hope that this will be a meaningful uh, time for you and that you will experience God uh, here or at least take this word and that you will experience God throughout your day or your week ahead. We're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit and we've made it up to patience. And so let's look at a couple of verses from Hebrews as we talk about patience. The author says in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we struggle with patience. Well, I know I do, and you do too. You know that about us. Lord, I pray that um, our patience would truly bear fruit for you and for your kingdom. Lord, I pray a blessing upon our time together today. And Lord, ask that you would um, speak through me and also speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned today, sermons on patience. Patience is the ability to wait for results that do not come immediately. It's rather ironic that this particular fruit of the Spirit fell to me. I should have had Pastor and Sue preach this week. She seems like a very patient person. Pastor David told us in his sermon last week that he has a lot of patience. But me, not so much. I kind of look at patience this way. It's something you admire in the driver behind you, but not so much in the one ahead. That's true for all of us sometimes. Margaret Thatcher, the former Prime Minister of England, earned the nickname the Iron Lady. She seemed to suffer from the same human view of patience that a lot of us have. She once said, I'm extraordinarily patient, provided I get my own way in the end. <laughs> Although she was trying to be witty, I think her comment was revealing about what a lot of us believe toward patience. In the book of Hebrews, there's a fascinating phrase. The writer says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's an interesting antithesis, run with patience. It feels like an oxymoron, like freezer burn, virtual reality, jumbo shrimp. Run with patience? Just exactly how do you do that? When I was a kid, I played sports that required short bursts of speed. People complain that baseball is slow, but let me tell you, when the ball is hit, the players move extraordinarily fast. If I hit the ball, I ran as fast as I could to first base. If I was playing the outfield, I would sprint to the ball to get back to the infield, lickety split so the runner wouldn't get an extra base. Same was true in basketball. I would use sudden bursts of speed to get around my opponent or to catch up with them when I was playing defense. I know, when you look at me, your first thought is, I bet that guy's really fast. It's probably the stole. Anyway, as an adult, I started to slow down and work on my endurance. I got into long distance running between my mid-30s and mid-40s. This actually requires completely different muscle fibers in your legs than sprinters use. But more than that, it requires a different mental mindset. In the two marathons that I've run, both of them took me more than five hours to complete. That's the very definition of running with patience. I don't like watching TV for five hours straight. Can you imagine continuously running for five hours? But that's exactly what the author is getting at. Life is like a long distance marathon, calling for good conditioning, proper strategy, 
and great endurance. Mental, physical, and spiritual preparation is as important as running the race itself. The goal must be firmly fixed. The desire must excite and stimulate. The plan and purpose must have meaning. Running with patience means keeping a long-range strategy in order to prevent burning out on the course. The classic story of the tortoise and the hare illustrates this point. The tortoise won the race because he ran it with patience. The hare, on the other hand, didn't take the race seriously, was not conditioned for it, was careless and casual about its importance, and had no deep desire to do his best. To his chagrin, he lost the race that he could have easily won. The tortoise, plodding and persistent, determined and enduring, moved unswervingly toward the goal and won his laurels because he was prepared to achieve. He had the patience and the will to win. But I'm not sure we're very patient people nowadays. We seem to always be in a hurry. Just a few common examples. For instance, people getting upset because their flight is delayed. Now I know, you're going to push back on this one. I plan my flight around my needs, and sometimes I have appointments to make too. But it seems a little strange that we get all bent out of shape because we have to wait an extra 45 minutes to get on a flight that will take us all the way across the country in just a few hours when our great-great-grandparents grew up in a time when that trip would have taken six months on a covered wagon. Or how about this? When you drive through line and you go up to get your food, and they tell you to pull up because your food isn't ready yet? What? This is fast food. I expect it to be ready now. If I wanted it to be good, I would have gone somewhere else. I don't care if it's good. I just want it fast. But the absolute worst has got to be that stupid spinning wheel on my phone that lets me know that it's searching for a website that I want to look at. Sometimes that thing will spin for 10 or 15 whole seconds to pull up something magically in my hand with technology that I didn't even know existed 15 years ago. I get so impatient waiting for that thing to pull up what I want to see. For instance, who is Travis Kelsey? Waiting, waiting. We must not be getting a good signal. Waiting. Oh, there it goes, finally. Oh, he's the tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's an eight-time Pro Bowler, two-time Super Bowl champ. He's been on reality shows, Saturday Night Live, many commercials, hosts a podcast with his brother Jason, and he's also expected to be either a hero or a villain in Taylor Swift's next album. You'll just have to wait and see. I try to tell my kids, you know what my internet search engine was growing up? It was called a card catalog and it could only be found at the library using the Dewey Decimal System. And they look at me like I grew up in a cave with a pet dinosaur. Anyway, during Jesus' time, during his three years of public ministry, which proved so vital to the world's salvation, we find absolutely no indication of impatience or bursts of speed that would outdistance his contemporaries. He paused often for prayer, for rest, for contemplation with his Father. He calmly taught his disciples and waited for the message to be absorbed in their often dull minds. Although the crowds grew larger and sometimes pushed around and about him, the Gospels indicated that he showed infinite patience with individuals and their needs. There was a lot to do and so little time. Yet there was no fruitless haste, no irresponsible rush. He allowed himself to be interrupted without getting off track from his main goal, running with patience. He stayed in step with God, giving his best self in those three brief years. The rest remained with the Lord of the harvest. Now contrast that to St. Paul, the activist, who would get upset with undue delays and upset plans and circumstances that he couldn't control. Rebellion, he finally found, was just fruitless. Rampant frustration would only lead to useless anger. So from behind prison bars, he sat down to write brilliant epistles to people and churches, 
preserving the best known records of his thoughts and teachings. What if he had never actually written those down? What if he'd never been in prison, forcing him to pause and write? The delays and impediments that stopped him in his tracks actually became the most productive ground for him to spread the good news. No wonder he could say at the end of his days, the glorious fight that God gave me I have fought. The course that was set I have finished, and I have kept the faith. Looking back on his life, he said that. Looking ahead, there were times when he would have been hard-pressed to believe the words would ever possibly come true. But when all the days were in and counted, the ledger showed that he had run the race of life with patience, learning from his handicaps, overcoming his frustrations, circumventing his suffering with patient perseverance, learning in his loneliest moments what God had to teach him, and always moving face forward up the hill toward heaven. Of course, when it comes to trials and tribulations, we still speak of the patience of Job. Through his period of testing, his cattle were stolen, his children were killed, his wife deserted him, and he became the victim of a terrible illness. Suddenly he's cast from the heights of affluence and success to the depths of misery and despair. He kept his balance because he didn't question the Almighty, but held to the conviction that heaven had a purpose in all this experience for him. He kept running his course with patience, even when it appeared that there was little left to live for. His so-called friends questioned his righteousness. His wife even told him to simply curse God and die. But when the fog lifted, Job was still on target. And we read, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Job died at the age of 140, being old and full of days. It's been said that patience is a wise teacher. Quaint though it may sound, it's nevertheless true. Adults as well as children are guilty of wanting to know all the answers right away without taking time to understand the problems in order that the answers might make sense. An answer given to someone unprepared to understand it brings no fulfillment. Only as one searches and struggles, blindly sometimes, even bitterly, lost and bewildered, waiting, wondering, seeking, searching, questing, patiently moving step by step, does she find that which is hidden for only the enduring eye to see? And then there's the whole matter of pain, suffering, or the ego illness of wanting to be in control and having our own way. How easy to blame God and rebel in bitterness. But nothing helpful happens. The unhappiness merely compounds itself. Only as the complainer learns anew the forgotten lessons of patience do grace, understanding, and perspective finally appear. Wholeness comes with healing, and healing with acceptance. Acceptance makes for understanding. Understanding presents alternatives. Alternatives give us sound choices. And sound choices result from preparedness. Preparedness comes from patience. Patience means waiting for the joy of discovery. Patience is the homework of life. It is preparation for every experience. It is the creative waiting, the sound assurance that this too shall pass. And on the other side of the mist, the sun will shine and God still cares. Patience means staying in step with self-capacity without trying to outdistance God. It's the art of being receptive, the ability to sort out the useless from the meaningful, creating quietness to listen. And yet it's also the determination to maintain the steady course, the stabilizer when panic threatens, the resolution to stay alert for the best signs in the worst times, and the grace to accept those things which cannot be changed. It's an art to be practiced, a skill to be sharpened, a faith to be kept, a philosophy to maintain, 
and a hope to keep bright. It's not blind surrender to inevitable fate or the cowardice that ceases to care. Instead, it's recognizing that in every life comes those moments or days, sometimes weeks, even years, when all the pieces of the puzzle don't seem to be present, when the clear course of action appears blurred, when the directional arrow is hazy, when the distant drum beats are just too muffled to recognize, the goals are slightly out of focus, the closed doors not yielding to our touch, the intuitive knowledge is still indecisive, the patterns not ready to recognize. And so we wait. And yet with waiting comes discovery out of nowhere. Although surely out of somewhere, right? It seems to steal across the mind, stimulate the senses, motivate the thought process, energize the intention, batter down the barriers of uncertainty. Suddenly the answer is plain. The direction is evident, the knowledge is sure, the heart is ready, and the soul is set. What appeared to be regression was actually preparation. What seemed like despair was really patience working out its wisdom. What looked like time wasted turned out to be the most fruitful of all experiences. And looking back on what appeared to be just the passing of time comes the awareness that we were making the best time. That's running with patience. Let me say one more thing. I have an unshakable faith in the ultimate providence of God. And still, more often than I want to admit, I've tried to hurry it along or manipulate it to my own ends. And there are times that I have resented or rebelled against what I believed were the results and implications. Yet as the years go by, my faith in the leading of God has only grown deeper. God moves with mysterious intent. I don't always get it. Our ways are not his ways, and our wants may not be his will. Yet to the one who truly listens, God supplies answers in abundance. To the one who's willing to wait, God gives invaluable insights. To the one who does not curse the darkness, God uses the blackness as the backdrop for brilliant illuminations. To the one who waits patiently, trusting in a providence that comes outside of oneself, God provides grace upon grace to meet, overcome, or accept according to our needs. God is ever more present than we realize and ever more active in our lives in times than we can possibly imagine. Old doors may close, but new doors have a strange way of swinging open. Some call it fate. Others call it luck. Many call it hard work or their own self-making. I call it the leading of the Lord, the guidance of the Spirit, the direction of Almighty God. Now, I realize today is just a random day in October, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a brand new day, an all-important day, a day in which you made the decision to accept the day still to come in your life as a gift. So may we run with patience the race that is set before us, our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Here today, May God give us wisdom for our task and patience for running the course ahead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, hardly any of us would ask for patience, maybe perseverance, but to wait is hard. Or teach us how to wait with hope, gaining wisdom, traction, knowledge, focus. Lord, 
Teach us how to stay on course and not to be distracted, but rather to look to the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, who died so that we might live. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Running with patience, staying the course, keeping our eyes focused on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what we're called to do, not to move to the left or the right, maybe to stop and rest, but to keep going, learning all the while how to be more like Jesus. Go forth in peace running with patience your life ahead.